Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour, wherever you are and however you are tuning in. We're so glad you're here. We'd like to send a hearty hello and thank you to Lorna and Oswald in Orlando, Florida. They have requested this morning the hymn uh, number 181, Does Jesus Care? And we know the answer, right? Oh yes, he cares. We'll sing all three verses of hymn 181. Please visit us at our website at saccentral.org. Click on the contact us link and tell us where you're from. Choose a song in the hymnal and we'll be singing them in the coming Sabbaths. Our last song comes from the continuation of the topical index of stewardship. And that is hymn number 639, A Diligent and Grateful Heart. Uh, let's do all four verses of hymn 639. Oh,
Dear Lord, we come today so thankful for the call. We ask, Lord, that you, you give us a diligent and grateful heart, a humble heart to answer the call. And this morning, Lord, we also ask for an open heart that we might receive your spirit as we're learning about your spirit. Bless Pastor Chris and bless us all. In your holy name we pray, amen. Our lesson study this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Chris Bettery, our senior pastor at Sac Central Church. It's good to see you. Trust everyone had a good week. You're dry now, uh, not waterlogged. We've had quite a bit of rain here in Northern California, which is a good thing for us and for many other people, that's for sure. And those that are tuning in, we're glad you are doing so as well. And of course, as our weekly custom is, we have a free offer for you, and it's offer today, C2176, C2176, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. And uh, we have a copy of this presentation on CD or DVD for you to review, and then of course to share with others. We do have ulterior motives. We want you to share that with somebody, your neighbor, your friend, your work colleague, someone who you think will appreciate it. Um, I also wanted to uh, give some acknowledgement to some uh, thank yous that have come in from our viewers. And uh, these two individuals, I do not know where they're from, but they wrote in and uh, they shared some things. And I'd like to read, uh, read them to you. This one is from Anonymous. Um, thank you. Uh, so appreciate the lesson studies. Each speaker is talented and presents spiritual applications. God bless Sacramento Central abundantly. Well, thank you very much, Anonymous. That's very thoughtful of you. And then this one is from Rita C. Often, she says, when teaching the Bible in my small hometown church, I've turned to this website when I have finished my Sabbath school lesson study. And equally often, I find additional meaning or depth or an illustration of some final polish for the lesson. I thank you for the time and effort that goes into putting these materials online. The written notes are my favorite. And so, Rita, we'll keep those notes coming the best as possible. And uh, we have a tremendous team here who keeps this rolling and a church, wonderful church that supports this program uh, wonderfully. And so we give thanks to everyone. And thank you for tuning in and joining us. Glad that these can be a blessing. Isn't it nice to know that uh, others are benefiting, not just yourselves, but uh, others are benefiting from what happens here at Central. And we continue to uh, push the gospel forward and, and being a blessing to others. Well, uh, we're going to go right into our lesson. Hope you got your Bibles handy and I uh, hope you have your lesson studies. We're in lesson number six. Lesson number six. And the title of this week's lesson is The Holy Spirit and Living a Holy Life. When we speak and we talk about something holy, sometimes it can... Uh, bring a little fear and trepida trepidation to a person's heart and mind. But um, we're going to look at what biblical holiness is, how the Holy Spirit plays a role in that in our lives, um, and just a few other things that are very important to this topic. Lesson number six, the Holy Spirit and, live, and a, living a holy life. And the scripture reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And uh, this is uh, taken from the, I'll read it from the New King James Version. And it says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. In the King James, it says, holy. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much of us does God want to be dedicated, consecrated to him? Everything. Yeah, that's right. The, the spirit or the mind, the soul, that spiritual part of man, the body, our physical being. God wants all of us wholly committed and consecrated to him. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, someone wrote this. Said, they said, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it's irresistible. Uh, interesting. And we're going to discover that truly holiness Biblical holiness is irresistible. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions as we begin here this morning. What comes to your mind when you think of holiness? When you think of the words holy or holiness? Do you think of something that's untouchable? Something perhaps that's out of your reach or maybe out of touch with everyday life? Um, do you think of something maybe that is frightening or overwhelming? Or do you see 
when you hear the word holy and holiness, you think of something that's awe-inspiring. Let me ask you another question. When you think of God, what do you think of? <laughs> now, I'm asking this question immediately after the previous questions because our understanding of God is inextricably linked to our understanding of holiness because of the very fact that God is, as, as was mentioned, God is holy. God is holy. Uh, he is holiness embodied. So our view of holiness and our view of God should not conflict. You, you get that, right? And so it's very important we understand, we understand who God is and we understand from that what holiness is. The concept of holiness is certainly little referred to in the world today around us. Uh, of course, there are references to holiness. Uh, for example, uh, the Holy Land often comes up in news articles and the news feeds. And then every so often you'll hear talk about the Holy Grail. Um, and then every now and then you'll uh, hear someone say maybe, holy cow, in response to or exclamation to uh, their surprise over something. Now, it's not just a topic, uh, it's not just a topic that's discussed much, but the average person doesn't pursue uh, holiness at all. Uh, don't even want to talk about it, don't even want to think about it, let alone pursuing it. Some things just aren't considered sacred today. Well, what about for you and me? What about for Christians? What about for you and me, followers of Jesus? What image does holiness conjure up in your mind? Maybe revival meetings, gospel trios, maybe old-time religion, perhaps stern prohibitions against movie theater attending, dancing and card playing? Or do we merely associate holiness with sexual purity, financial responsibility and honesty, and commitment to a private prayer life? What images conjure, you conjure up in your mind regarding holiness. Is it possible, is it possible that we view holiness as though it were outdated or something that characterizes only a very small part of the believer's life? Is this is true, then could it be partly due to our quest as a church, maybe as individuals, for cultural relevance, which is often defended in the name of winning people to Jesus? If we think uh, about holiness, or if we talk about holiness with unbelievers, won't that present just another hurdle for them to overcome in their way to finding Jesus? Perhaps for this and other reasons, we're forsaking our commitment to holiness. Recent polls have shown, interestingly and sadly, that many self-described, self-professed Christians uh, march in moral lockstep with mainstream American culture in the following areas, in the practice of divorce, spousal abuse, extramarital sex, pornography, uh, consumption, materialism, and racism. And that's just to name a few things. Now, we may tip our hat to the importance of holiness. Many in our culture don't view us morally different in any meaningful way, except they may see Christians as mere hypocrites. Is it possible that one crucial ingredient in sorting out our moral confusion is the recovery of the biblical idea of holiness? Certainly. Certainly. Well, so what is holiness? What does the word mean? Holiness, the Hebrew word for holiness is kadesh. When you read it in the Old Testament scriptures, in the most part, it means kadesh, which means something that is cut off or separated or set apart for a sacred use. Um, uh, one definition says that holiness is anti-secular. Let me, this is what they mean by that. It's described as anti-secular or of or relating to worldly or the temporal. Um, and so holiness is in a category, Kadesh is in a category all on its own. Uh, Kadesh describes something that is elevated out of our sphere um, of what is ordinary. Now the New Testament word for holy is hagios. And that simply means the same thing, set apart, separate, and so it's in a class all by itself. In both the Old and the New Testaments, the term is applied to things. Can you think of some things that the Bible talks about? Remember Moses came into the presence of God and he was standing on holy ground. That's right. So there was holy ground in the presence of God. God's people met on Sabbath and Sabbath was known as a 
holy convocation, right? We'll get to the holy day in just a minute. Well, yeah, we might as well just talk about the holy day. The Sabbath is a holy day. That's right. Um, Think about the sanctuary for just a moment. There were two rooms inside the sanctuary, the holy place and the most holy or the holiest of all. And then, of course, the priest, his garments were named holy. His crown, his mitre was known as a holy mitre. And the oil that he was consecrated and dedicated with was known as holy oil. There's nothing magical or anything significant in the oil. It just meant that it was consecrated for the consecration of the instruments of the sanctuary and of the priest uh, who ministered in the sanctuary. So when you read the Old and New Testament, you'll see that things are attached to the name or the word holy. Uh, Also, uh, people. Who do you think of? Or what can you think of when you think of the word holy in reference to people? God's people, God's church. He calls his people holy ones or a holy nation, you see. And then, of course, the name or the word holy is prescribed preeminently to God himself. And no wonder, because God is holy. And specifically, His name, his person, who he is, he is holy, and his name. His name is often uh, referred to as being holy. And of course, we need not forget, and we shouldn't forget, that the third person of the Godhead is known as the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And we'll discover that the Holy Spirit is the active agent in the Godhead that brings holiness to the believer's life. So let's uh, go over to Sunday's lesson, the holiness of God, and let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 13 to 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Let's take a look at what the, uh, the apostle wrote. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Verse 16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Uh, Someone wrote that the the true Christian ideal is not to be happy, but to be holy. That's the true Christian ideal. In so much that we are not praying I. ultimately for happiness, God, bring happiness to my life. We ought to be praying ultimately, God, bring holiness to my life. That's the priority of a Christian. And according to these verses, according to what we read, the motivation for being holy is intimately connected to the reality of a holy God or God who is holy. The statement, be holy for I am holy, implies that holiness is a bad or good thing. It's a good thing, right? If God says, I'm holy, therefore be holy, holiness is a good thing as opposed to something we should be afraid of, something that we should worry about. It's a good thing, something good to be desired. It also implies, the statement also implies that the motivation to become holy is not fueled by fear of offending a tyrannical God because God is not tyrannical, number one, and God doesn't demand it of us uh, in an austere way. So uh, the, the words, be holy for I am holy, uh, implies the motivation for being holy is fueled not by offending a tyrannical God, but is fueled by a deep appreciation for and love for who God is. A deep appreciation for holiness, a deep appreciation for God, who he is, and who he is to us. His holiness in other words, has an attractive quality, much like sweet nectar is to a bee, right? So when you think about holiness, you're thinking about God, because God is holy, and God is attractive, just like nectar to a bee. God's holiness doesn't repel. It doesn't repel. Now, Peter, in these verses, he's quoting the Old Testament, specifically Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, and Leviticus 19, verse 2. Be holy, for I am holy. So what does it mean that God is holy. What does it mean that God is holy? First of all, it needs to be noted that the idea of holiness is connected with God's name more than his attributes. When you read the scriptures and you study the subject out, you'll see that the word holy is connected more to his name than to his attributes. Um, God's name, essentially, when you're reading, God says, glorify my name, honor my name, don't take my name in vain. He's referring to his person, his character, 
who God is. And, um, and so when we're, we're talking about the holiness of God, we're referring to his character, who he is. And you can see Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7 to understand the, 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 um, the correlation between the name of God and his attributes or his character. Um, got a few verses we'll look at here to, to, uh, to see how God's name Holiness is connected to God's name, and we'll, we'll learn a few things about what holiness is as well. Someone has Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. We need you to read that for us in just a few moments. Richard, we're going to come to you in just a moment. First of all, we have Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25. Isaiah 40, 25, and it says this, To whom then will you liken me? This is God speaking. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. So God says he is in a class all by himself, and he is described as what? The Holy One, he says. So who is equal to me? Who can be compared to me? Um, Ezekiel 39, verse 7. Let's take a look at that. Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 7. It says, So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord. And then again, he's referred to as the Holy One in Israel. He himself calls himself that, the Holy One in Israel. And so we'll look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, Richard, if you don't mind. We'll, get to, uh, we'll come right over to you right now. Thank you. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So referring to God, the angels are crying, holy, how many times? Three times. And the emphasis there is because God is holy. He's not just holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And of course, one could suggest, and it's not a stretch, to, know, to say that the, the reference to God's holiness, that God is holy three times, mentioned three times, is because there are three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy God, who is holy, holy, holy. And, 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 but I don't, want to, I don't want to get away from the fact that the angels had to repeat it three times. They couldn't just say it once because in his presence, they, could, they just had to say he was holy, and then they had to say it again, and then they had to say it again. So God is certainly holy. And of course, reading this in Revelation, it reminds you of an experience that Isaiah witnessed in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Angels were saying the same thing about God. Holy, holy, holy. So these verses remind us that God is high above any other and that no one can be compared with him. I'm going to quote here from A.W. Tozer. He wrote this, to be holy he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. And so let's think of some attributes of God. What are some of the attributes of God? Love. God is love. So is God's love holy? You better believe it is. What about God's mercy? Is his mercy holy? It certainly is. What about God's justness, his righteousness? It is holy. That's exactly right. Every attribute connected with God, we must consider and see in the terms of holiness. For God is holy. And... Um, we could even say that his anger towards sin is a holy anger. Uh, we read in the second commandment that God is a jealous God. Now, he's not jealous like we would get jealous and get off, go off in fits of rage and, and seek revenge. God's jealousy is a holy jealousy. And so we, we must not forget that any attribute connected with God, it is holy. It is holy. Uh, let's, let's consider for just a moment the fact that it might be better to suggest that, it, that God, it would be better if God did not exist. 
than for him to be unjust, unloving and unkind. Otherwise, we would be serving a tyrannical, spiteful God and it would be better that he didn't exist. I think you would agree. This is why a number of people say they don't want to believe in God because they have a wrong view of God. If that's God, I don't want anything to do with him. And furthermore, I'm just not going to think that he exists and I'm going to live my life. And so it's ultimately important that we understand the character, the nature of God. God's love and his holiness ought to belong together. And here's the reason why. <clears throat> Without God's holiness, his love would be in danger of becoming sentimental, just something based upon feeling and emotion. And conversely, God's holiness would be uh, in danger of becoming stern and unapproachable without his love. And so both his attributes, his love and his holiness, are foundational to his nature and they cannot ever be divided. So when we talk about God's love, we must not separate it from his holiness. And when we talk about his holiness, we should never separate it from his love. The two go hand in hand because God is holy and God is love equally. All of that. And uh, here's God because of that. Let's take a look at Monday's lesson. Let's continue uh, building the, uh, the, the case here for the, the need, not just for the need to be holy, but what holiness means in, in our lives as God brings it to our lives. The nature of holiness. This is Monday's lesson. What's God's desire for his people? What is God's desire for his people? Ultimately, he wants us to be saved. Um, in 1 Thessalonians, it says that God's will is the sanctification of his people. Now, the word holy and sanctification, synonymous terms in the scriptures. So when you're reading about something sanctified, that thing that's sanctified has been set apart for a holy or sacred use. It's the same idea as holiness. Holiness is something that's set apart for a sacred use. Uh, so sanctified and holy, uh, sanctified and holy, same words essentially. So God desires a holy and a sanctified people. The, um, the cross of Calvary doesn't just speak to us of forgiveness. It speak to, speaks to us of being separated and set apart for a holy use. And we'll see that in a verse coming up here in a few moments. In, uh, I think it's in Tuesday's lesson. But look, we've got a few verses to read here uh, to, to verify that the, when we read the scriptures, the Bible tells us clearly that God desires from his people holiness. I'm not just telling you this because I think it's a good idea. The scriptures are very, very clear that God desires his people to be holy. So let's take a look at a few verses uh, together. Someone has 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. And Karen, we're going to come to you in just a moment. We're going to read a couple more before we get there. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 says, Just as he, Jesus, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So what is God's desire and purpose for his people? That they might be what? Holy. That they might be holy. Let's read chapter 5 of Ephesians, verses 25 to 27. We know this one. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might, now listen, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, speaking of you and me, the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, he, that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, we can't escape the fact that God's purpose and expectations and desires for his people is holiness. It's just clear. God says, I'm, I'm going to prepare her and present her as my holy people. He wants his people to be holy. And then this one in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace, the apostle says, pursue peace with all people. Uh, you know, by some people's uh, posts on Facebook, you would think that they're not pursuing peace with everyone uh, as, as much as maybe they ought to. Uh, always getting into controversies, always trying to stir up arguments and conversations, especially in the political arena. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Karen, thank you. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we're called to perfect holiness in the fear of God. So I think it, there's no, no doubt here that God expects holiness from his people. 
Um, a question might be asked by us, though, who wants to be holy? Uh, in our day, the term can suggest something that's austere, maybe something that's unnatural, uh, someone who's been canonized like a saint. Because when, when you read the scriptures and you read the word saint uh, and you read the word holy, essentially they're synonymous terms. Uh, maybe someone's thinking of almost somebody who has a visible halo around their heads. The question is, do we really qualify for holiness? And if you're like me, uh, you, you would feel a sense of inadequacy when we talk about holiness. Who wants to go around and say, I'm holy? It's kind of awkward, isn't it? To think of being holy is, as something that's akin to earning a merit badge um, is essentially to misconstrue the biblical term. When the New Testament describes people as holy ones, the thought is not only about behavior, but also position. It's very important for us to understand. The word holy describes something, as we've already noted, something that's separated, something that's set apart for a sacred use. God is holy because he is separate from humanity. He cannot be grouped with us as the same kind of being. When you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, which we'll look at in just a few moments, but there Paul refers to God's people as being sanctified, and it's in the past tense. They are sanctified. Um, in other words, those who've been set apart by God. So to be holy means to be separated by God. It not only refers to God's actions, and it not only refers to God's actions apart from us, but it also includes the responsibility that ours, of ours to live holy lives in his presence. So here it is again. Let me say that again. When we come to Jesus and he, we, we, we give him our hearts, we ask him for f the forgiveness of sins, he justifies us and he also what? Sanctifies us. He sets us apart at that moment. And now we are his, holy his, his children. And, but it doesn't end there. Holiness, we continue in that sanctification experience, growing up in the likeness of Jesus, you see. So holiness at the beginning... We are, we are considered holy by God at the beginning because he separated us from the world, from sin. We've been justified and we've been sanctified. And yet there's a continual process that, that will continue till the day we die. For sanctification is the work of a lifetime. That's right. And so I hope you understand that. We are sanctified at the beginning of our walk and we are being sanctified throughout the continuation of our walk. In Colossians 2, verse 6, the Apostle Paul said, As you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. And we walk in Christ by faith because of his grace, you see. All right, so it's very important we understand that. Let me see if I can draw an illustration to help us a little bit more. Uh, in the forests of northern Europe and in some parts of Asia, there lives a little animal, and that little animal is called a stoat, a stoat or a stoat or an ermine. And this little creature is from the weasel family. And it's known for its snow white fur in the winter. And if you look at a picture of it, it's, it's quite remarkable, beautiful uh, coat that it has for the winter months. Um, and so this little uh, weasel or this ermine instinctively protects his white coat against anything that would soil it. So for fur hunters, they will take advantage of this instinct or this unusual trait of the ermine. So they don't set a, a snare or a trap to catch it, to get the fur of the ermine. Instead, they find where the ermine lives. And the ermine lives in a cleft in a rock or in some hollow of an old tree. And they smear the entrance and the interior with dirt and grime and muck. And then the hunters send their dogs. The dogs chase the ermines. The ermines say, ah, they run home. And when they see the dirt at the entrance, they do not go in. And they are trapped by the dogs and the hunters, and then they make fur coats. So for the ermine, for the ermine, purity is more precious than life. Purity is more precious than life. See, God separates us to himself and declares us holy. Declares us holy. He then expects that we live and preserve the holiness we have been called to, no matter the cost, no matter the cost. Holiness is the absence of sin. Holiness is essentially being holy gods. And so that's what God's called us to. Let's talk a little bit more about it. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson, the agent of sanctification. 
What do the following verses tell us? We're going to look at some of these verses. Um, and we're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11 here as well. But someone has Titus 3, verse 5. Titus 3, verse 5, we're all the way over here. Nathan, we'll get to you in just a quick sec. Um, here's a couple of verses first. Hebrews 13, verse 12. We're talking about sanctification. We're going to talk about the agent of sanctification as well. Hebrews 13, verse 12 says, Therefore, Jesus also, that he might... Now, I want you to notice that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He suffered outside the gate. So you and I are sanctified by our works? No. According to this verse, we are sanctified by his blood. When does that happen? When does that happen? When we come to Jesus and we, for the first time, and we repent and he receives us and he does what? Sanctifies us. Sets us apart right there to make us, he says, you are my holy child. And you know, the interesting thing about all of this, and this is very important to understand. The interesting thing is what God declares, he makes. What God declares, he makes. God doesn't say you are holy and then doesn't make you holy. Because that would just be a, a major contradiction, wouldn't it? You're holy and then you just go off and live any life you want to live, an unholy life. That wouldn't be right. What God declares, he makes. Because when God spoke... He said, let there be light. There was what? It happened. When God said, let, the, let there be a firmament between the waters, what happened? Firmament, sky. When he said sun and moon and stars, what happened? When he says holy, what happens? You are being made holy. Yeah, because there's power in his word, you see. Um, anyway, let's look at another verse, 1 Corinthians six eleven. And this is what I referred to earlier. Paul says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. And so that's past tense. When we come to Jesus for the first time, he separates us and makes us his children. We are holy. He declares us to be holy. And then we continue in that holiness. And notice what it says there. We are, we are justified. We are sanctified by the Spirit of God. And so here we're introduced to the agent of sanctification. He is the Holy Spirit. After all, the, the lesson this quarter is on the Holy Spirit, right? And then Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Nathan, if you don't mind. Not by words of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Yes. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So who is the regenerating agent who is the renewing agent according to titus 3 verse 5 the holy spirit exactly uh, jesus said in john chapter 3 verse 3 if uh, you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven and then he clarifies what he means in verse 5 you must be born of water and of the spirit so it is the holy spirit that converts or changes our hearts it's the holy spirit who renews us daily. And like Paul said, he died daily so that he could be renewed by the Holy Spirit. His inner man could be renewed daily by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the great regenerating, renewing agency of the Godhead. Holiness then is a gift from God. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. We are both justified and sanctified by Christ's blood and the active agent in accomplishing what the gospel entails, which is holiness, is the Holy Spirit. And this is a gift. So when Peter says in, uh, when Peter says in 1 Peter, be partakers of the divine nature, the holy nature of God, he's, not, he's serious. He's not messing around. He, you, it is possible that you and I can become partakers of the divine nature and we become partakers of the divine nature through the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So what Christ did on Calvary and his perfect life would be to no avail if the Holy Spirit had not been sent. He makes, he makes it effectual, effective, brings the reality of what Jesus did to our lives. And I like that. I praise the Lord for that. She goes on to say, it is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power. Now notice, to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil. 
and to impress his own character upon his church. What's, what a her, this, is, this is Desire of Ages, page 671. What's, um, what are hereditary tendencies to evil? Those are things that have been passed on down from our, from our folks and from their folks and from their folks. And so if there's alcoholism in the family, that weakness can come through the line. If there's heart disease in the family, then that can come through the line, you see. Those are hereditary. What about cultivated tendencies to evil? Those are things that we have practiced. It's like cultivating the ground. You're working it with your hands, right, to prepare to plant the seed. Cultivated tendencies to evil are those things that we have practiced, and we've all practiced sin. We all have uh, an attitude, uh, in action, in thought. And so those are cultivated, and we're told that the Holy Spirit, this divine power, has come, has been given as a divine power to overcome all of these things. Not that there won't be a pull to sin, not that there won't be temptation, inward and outward. Not that it won't be there. It will be there, believe you me, until Jesus returns. That will be there. But by the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we can overcome all of those things. If you have anger issues, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome. If you're prone to beating up on your children and your wife, by the Holy Spirit's power, you must and you will and you can overcome. If you have problems with race, if there are those types of issues in your heart, racism, Holy Spirit can expel those things. The Holy Spirit is powerful and can change hearts and can change lives. And we ought not doubt that. If you are an uncaring person by nature, and most of us are selfish by nature, then we can become unselfish creatures by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's good news. What do you say? Amen. Very good news, because I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to succumb to my human nature, my carnal nature. I don't want to do that. I hope you don't either. I know it's there. I know it dogs me every step of the way. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and it can be ours entirely. And we thank the Lord for that. What do you say? Again, amen. All right, Wednesday, let's go over there. The rule of holiness is God's law. There is a standard of holiness. Of course, it's God and it's expressed in his law, uh, the law of God. We know that as Christians, we're called to keep the Ten Commandments. Um, The question will arise, and this is brought up in the lesson, why should we keep his law when we're not saved by keeping the law? The answer is connected, of course, to the idea of holiness, what we're studying here today. Now, according to a couple of verses, Romans 7, 12, and 1 Timothy 1, 8, the Bible says that the law of God is holy and just and good. Do you know someone else that is holy and just and good? It's God. That's exactly right. That means that the law is really an expression of whom? God. And if God is holy, then his law is holy. And if the law is holy, then of course we're referring to God's character, him being holy. So when we live a spirit-filled life, because that's what we've just been talking about, when we live a spirit-filled life, we keep God's law. God's law is the standard of holiness because it reflects who God is. And this is the reason God's law can never be abolished. If we get rid of the law, we'd be getting rid of God and his character. So just to clear up the air, keeping the law is not legalism. Now, if you're trying to do it in your own strength and you're doing it to earn merit and to get to heaven, then then it's legalism. But true, honest, biblical law keeping done by the grace of God through the working of the Holy Spirit in the life is not legalism. Uh, The Sabbath school lesson says this, and I I wanted to quote it because it's pretty powerful. This is on page 50 of your lessons. He says, the law, uh, let me back up. He says, the law is never our way to salvation. Rather, it is the path of the saved. Don't you like that? There's some things that people just write it and it just sounds really good. And uh, you've got to hold on to those things. The law is is not our way to salvation. It is the path of the saved. He goes on to say, the law, so to speak, is the pair of shoes in which our love walks and expresses itself. So when the law is not appreciated, guess what happens? What happens to love? True biblical love. It's diminished, isn't it? That's why Jesus said in, uh, in Matthew 24 and verse 12, uh, talking about the last days, iniquity or lawlessness will abound and the love of many will what? Grow cold. So the two are inextricably linked. A lack of appreciation for the law of God, and there goes love as well, down the drain. And you know, that's so contrary to what most Christians are taught from their pulpits. We need to do away with the law in order so that we might understand what true love is. Something like that. Or the law is not that we need to just love. 
and law, we don't, law legalism. Love, that's the way. Because after all, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And uh, of course, that can't be the case. And we'll look at a verse here where it actually clarifies what Jesus was saying. Uh, why don't we do that right now, actually? Someone's got Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Pam, coming right over to you. First of all, I want to read Romans 13, verse 10. Notice what it says. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So when we think about the law of God, of course, we're thinking about the last six commandments. And those last six commandments have to do with our relationship with one another, don't they? So when we love our neighbor as ourself, what are we doing with the law? We're keeping it. It's being fulfilled in us, not by us, but in us by the Holy Spirit. Um, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, Pam. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Thank you. So love, love to God, supremely love to our neighbor, like two nails on a wall. And what hangs on, that, on those nails? The law. So love does not do away with the law. What does love do? establishes and props up the law so that everyone can see it lived out in the lives of those who have the law written on their hearts, you see. Um, love, loving God and loving man is a fulfilling of the law. Uh, on the same page, page 50 of the lesson, the writer says, while the rule and norm for holiness is God's law, I love this, the heart of his holiness is love. Let me read that again. While the norm and rule for holiness is God's law, the heart of his holiness is love. That's at the center of the law of God. When you break God's law, and I've said it before and you've heard me say it, when you break God's law, you're breaking God's heart. You're breaking God's heart and maybe someone else's. Love is always faithful. When I say I love Jennifer, my wife, that means I am saying to her I am faithful to her. She is my one and she is my only. I have blinders on. Those billboards and stores through the mall, boom, blinders. And God gave men a neck with muscles in it so that they could turn their heads. And women too. You can turn our heads. We can look away, right? So love says that we are faithful. Love is always faithful. And that's why those who love will keep the law of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it will be manifested in a life that loves God supremely and treats his neighbor or her neighbor as you would treat yourself. So that's what love is. Love is faithful, and because it's faithful, it's obedient. It's obedient, and, it, and it's obedient to those laws that preserve meaningful relationships. First and foremost, our relationship with God, and then our relationships with one another. Let's go to Thursday's lesson, Pursuing Holiness, and uh, we'll come to a close of our lesson, Pursuing Holiness, because as we've discovered, God expects and wants his people to be holy. And we've also discovered that uh, the act of making us holy is God's act. Uh, he declares us and makes us holy when we first give our hearts and lives to him. At the beginning of our walk, he sanctifies us, sets us apart for holy use. And then by his spirit, he keeps working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. We grow up to become more and more like Jesus. That's the work of sanctification that happens over a lifetime. We never get to a point where we'll say we can never sin. That's not what true sanctification, true holiness is. But that's God working in us. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about holiness. But it's the work of God as we cooperate with God. Look at a few verses here with me. And let's ask the question, what do these verses tell us about holiness? Uh, 2 Timothy 2.21, someone's got that for us. This is our last verse for this morning, for the, uh, someone to read the scripture. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 21. We're going to come over to you in just a moment. Hold tight, thanks. All right, first of all, we're going to read Psalm, Psalm 15 verses 1 and 2. Notice what it says. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who can dwell with you? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Now notice the answer. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. And so who are those who will see God? 
Well, Jesus said, those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Here, this verse tells us those who walk uprightly, those who work righteousness, those who live holy lives. Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24, we'll read this before we get to 2 Timothy. Notice, that you put off, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So it's a gift, isn't it? Holiness is a gift. Um, it's a gift from God, comes from God, who is God, who is holy. Now, 2 Timothy 2.21, thank you. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Thank you very much. So let's put these verses together. What do these verses tell us about holiness? First of all, it tells us without holiness, we will not see God. That's what it's very clear. Um, also, holiness, the verse that was just read, is, pre, is a precondition to our being useful in God's service. So God wants us to be holy so that we're useful to him in his service. And, uh, and we need to understand when, we, when we're thinking about and talking about going to heaven, the only thing that we take with us is our character. The only thing we take with us is our character. Character is all we take. And character, how is character formed? Character is formed through habits, repeated thoughts and actions, right? That's how we form habits, and habits, uh, habits form character. And we could say that character ultimately determines our destiny. So sanctification involves thinking new thoughts and involves forming new habits. And as the writer says in the lesson on page 51, he says, this is not self-sanctification through self-effort. Habit forming is the ordinary way that the Spirit leads us to holiness. It's the ordinary way. It's how the Holy Spirit works. He takes us from point A to point B to point C, and he grows us. He work and, and granted, this is no easy task. The biggest challenge we have and the biggest fight that we have is the fight against whom? It's not your neighbor. It's not uh, someone who tends to get under your skin at times. It's not your spouse. Um, it's none of that, those things, none of those people. It's yourself. The greatest fight we have is a fight against self and the surrender of self. That's the biggest struggle. That's why Jesus said, uh, let, take up your cross, deny yourself. He didn't list a whole bunch of things to deny because he knew if you just would deny yourself and follow him, those things would take care of themselves. He didn't list off a whole bunch of things. The issue, the struggle we have is with self. It is self-surrender that we're dealing with here. Surrendering to the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. And so when I'm tempted to get mad, I say, God, just help me here. Count to 10. Holy Spirit, please work in me. Help me to what I'm about to say. Say it with grace and with tact. Help me at this moment. And that's what it looks like. And we say something that, that, that Jesus would be pleased with. And you, you, your whole spirit may be still stirred up inside, but you're, you're just asking God to help you form a new habit of how to respond and react when you've been dismissed or when you've been put down or you've been name-called or whatever it is. He's teaching us new habits in ways to behave, in ways to respond to situations. We must surrender, not just at the beginning of the day as we kneel down by our beds and say, God, come into my heart, lead me, guide me through this day. But we need to live that prayer and ask him to do that. Sometimes you have to do it moments because there's issues that just come at you like a flood. Boom, boom, boom. You're saying, God, you know, I have my heart, have my lips, have my all because right now I'm ready to explode. I'm ready to deal with this in a way that's not Christ-like. And we surrender to Jesus. This is real stuff, real fight, real battle. Daily, you know what it's like. But we don't need to succumb or surrender to temptation or to sin, we can be victorious in Jesus Christ. Amen. As the Spirit of God works in us, on us and in us, and as we cooperate with this work, we'll form habits that will reflect the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in us, and that evidence is known as the fruit of the Spirit. God wants us to form habits in those areas, good habits in those areas of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, self-control, um, 
patience, and even some of those more, what would be termed as more active or aggressive virtues, like, uh, like um, oh, what would it be? Courage. Courage would be one. Faith, fearlessness. He wants, those, he wants us to develop good habits by the power of the, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. D.L. Moody, he said, a holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses don't blow horns. They just shine. Holiness is not, uh, we don't become self-congratulatory if we, uh, in, in holiness. As a matter of fact, holiness is humble. True holiness is humble. Recognizing that if it wasn't but for the grace of God, you'd stumble, you'd fall, you'd be where you were before. But it's the grace of God that is sustaining, that is keeping you, that is aiding you, that is encouraging and helping you along the way. Lighthouses don't blow horns, they just shine. And then to close, Tozer said, although God wants his people to be holy as he is holy, Listen carefully. He does not deal with us according to the degree of our holiness, but according to the abundance of his mercy. But according to the abundance of his mercy. The pursuit of holiness, friends, is the calling of every Christian. It's our calling. We've been called to holiness, no doubt about it. When we seek holiness, we are seeking God himself who is holy. So don't forget that. When we are seeking holiness, you're seeking God. I'm seeking God. We're seeking him who is holy. And the Holy Spirit is the one who aids us and who strengthens us in our pursuit. So open your heart daily and, uh, and let him do that special work in your heart. What do you say? Sure. So glad that you were able to join us for the study this morning. And those that have been uh, tuning in, glad you have done so as well. Uh, don't forget to call in for your free offer. Today it's offer C21706. And you just need to email csh at saccentral.org or call us at 916-457-6511 and you'll receive a copy of today's free offer. Don't forget to give us your full address. And um, if you want the study notes, go to our website, saccentral.org. Click on the CSH banner. And you'll be able to pull up the study notes from this class. And of course, as always, we will see you next week. God bless you.